Welcome back, everybody. I'm hoping that you are having an awesome day today. Today, we want to get right on into the topic, which is how to use a glass reactor, how it can be applied in your laboratory, what are the uses for it, where you can buy it, and some theoretical applications to kind of get you guys going. I'm Grim with WKU Consulting, and without any further ado, Let's jump right on into it. So we'll go ahead and jump right on in here. Um, for everybody that's watching, we want to first go over with what is a glass reactor. What actually is a glass reactor? So here I've made a little diagram. This is a glass reactor and we'll be going through each and every specific type uh, and piece of the glass reactor and what it can be used for real quick. So here is your double layer glass kettle body and I apologize for the typos. Apparently I have some here and a coin denser is actually a condenser. So here we have our glass reactor and this is where our mixture will be. Here we have our interlayer liquid inlet which is what we are going to circulate heating or chilling fluid through in this jacket that's surrounding it. Here we have some wheel brakes to keep this unit from moving around. Right here you'll see the discharge valve which will allow us to recover whatever happened inside of our reactionary vessel right here. Here you have the feeding inlet, which is where we will be able to transfer material into the actual glass reactor for the reaction to take place. Right here, this little guy you will find is a bleed valve, and this bleed valve is actually only for bleeding oxygen into the reaction depending on what reaction you're doing. It can also be used as an auxiliary port. Uh, here you have a constant pressure drop plus funnel. So if you wanted to use a graduated cylinder back here to kind of measure how much of each specific material you're allowing to feed in here, you can use that for that. Right here is what we will have. It's a digital display inverter. So this is going to tell us our stir speed, our vacuum pressure, and our temperature that's in our thermometer right there. You can see it will all be reading right here on the back of this display module. This right here is what we call an overhead stir motor or a gear motor. It's connected to a PTFE stir rod, which will actually allow us to homogenize the reaction inside. This is our condenser right here, glass condenser. So this will actually have a cooling water or a chilling fluid outlet. An inlet, uh, by the way, if you're ever filling up chilling fluid, you want to fill against gravity so that it fills every part of uh, the material. Uh, but basically what's happening here is as you reflux or boil off um, and anything comes into a vapor under boiling point, it'll transfer up here through the vacuum, travel along this condensing coil, the condensing coil will turn it back into a liquid and allow it to fall here into our collection bottle. At the bottom of the collection bottle, you'll see a uh, discharge valve where you can pull it back out. Once again, that's the temperature sensor that we were talking about, this rod that sticks down in there and measures the internal temperature. Because a lot of the times you will have something measuring the external temperature. However, you really want to know uh, on, in organic chemistry what's actually the temperature inside of your mixture. A backflow elbow just prevents any of this recondensed material from coming back into the reaction or forcing it to come back into the reaction depending on your application. And here if you wanted to connect the whole thing to vacuum you would actually do so up here at the vacuum elbow which will be connected to a piece of auxiliary equipment somewhere down here that we'll get to in just a minute but you'll be able to connect this with vacuum hose 
And if everything's tight and secure and sealed up, this whole mixture will go under vacuum. Now this is a glass reactor. If you're in an industrial setting, you're going to see a bunch of these uh, quite frequently. They have a plethora of applications and we will get into what those are. If you need to go back and take notes or take a picture screenshot of this, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, once again, I apologize for the, uh, the typos. So here is some auxiliary equipment that we want to talk about. This here is um, what I like to call the uh, Porsche of all auxiliary equipment, well, heaters and chillers. This is a Huber Unistat 316. Now, this has an extreme temperature range of um, down to negative 40 degrees Celsius or up to 250 degrees Celsius. Now this will also run you approximately $45,000. However, it has a control module that you can input parameters in in a programmable way which will enable you to set it and then walk off. Here is what you will find uh, the internal uh, volume of whatever fluid that you're using and be sure that you do some research we're not going to go over it today but if you're cooling use appropriate cooling fluid that's not going to void your warranty if you are heating use the correct heating fluid and if you're doing some sort of remediation then you also want to be able to have uh, light pass through uh, that silicon or whatever that you're using in here. And this is just an emergency disconnect valve. But what this is for is it's going to be able to regulate the internal temperature on the glass reactor that you show we showed you, the uh, inlet and the outlet. It's going to pump that circulating fluid into there and be able to hold whatever temperature you've programmed into here so that your reaction is under a controlled temperature. Now, if you're using a glass reactor, the chances are is that you'll always need a piece of auxiliary equipment. This is just my favorite one. Uh, Jalabo makes some. USA Lab makes some. You can find them all over the place. Uh, however, uh, I put my favorite because there is no limit to the amount of uses that you can get out of here. Uh, it will also cost you about three times the amount of uh, what the glass reactor costs you. So, you know, uh, however you weigh your costs against that is will be your choice as the business owner or technician. Another piece of auxiliary equipment that we'll talk about here uh, from the vacuum elbow that we showed you at the top of the condensing coil will be something like this, dry scroll vacuum pump. Uh, this is from Agilent Technologies. I really like it because it's explosion proof and it can handle flammable vapors. However, um, there's also some welch pumps and diaphragm pumps. I I like the dry scroll pump because um, it will not wear out that the the gases that you're transferring through there or uh, you know other volatiles like terpenes will not wear out that diaphragm over time. So longevity you will have um, a much greater longevity here. And so basically you pull vacuum from here and export to here. If you've got some sort of stinky or smelly um, thing that you're vacuuming out of the glass reactor, you can actually export this to your exhaust ventilation. That way you don't have to smell it. And then this will connect uh, through a K25 or a K15 flange, and you'll be able to connect to that vacuum elbow using that we showed you on the condensing coil using um you know a vacuum hose so these are the two pieces of auxiliary equipment that you will definitely need pretty much no matter the application that you're using your glass reactor for um, and you can find these just by googling heating heater or chiller and um, vacuum pump and kind of do some research and pick the one that fits you the best. These are my two favorite, which is why I chose them for this video. Okay, so where can we buy a glass reactor? In a minute, we're going to go over what the uses are, but when you determine that you need one and that you can use one, where do you actually find them? 
So you can find them all over the place. These are the most reputable, um, you know, in my 10 years of experience where I find um, the best manufacturers for these specific pieces of equipment. I almost always like to get my um, vacuum ovens as well as glass reactors and everything like that from across international. Now, they're not paying me to say this, so I'm saying it in goodwill that I actually just am thoroughly impressed with the quality of material that they manufacture. Uh, but you can just Google this across international glass reactor, and then you'll just have to decide... Um, you know, the, the price is going to range from 10 to 20 K depending on, you know, do you want a 50 liter, a hundred liter, a 25 liter, even a five or 10 liter glass reactors are all manufactured. You almost always want to have either a single jacketed or a dual jacketed. Uh, my secondary choice for purchasing place would be USA lab. My third would be lab society. And then Thomas Scientific, if I'm in a pinch and need one immediately. My very last resort, uh, which means probably never, but you can also find these on DHK, Alibaba, and eBay. Uh, if you're looking for used materials, sometime you can find one there. Just know that those are not going to come with the manufacturer's warranty. Uh, so it's kind of take your chances and you get what you get situation. Um, and... I'm not a big fan of that, so here's where you can buy them. Now let's go into some uses for these glass reactors, and it doesn't matter how big or how small. The uses can be the same. The only thing that matters on how large or how small will be your projected throughput in your laboratory. So one of the uses is for simple extraction. Uh, if you're using ethanol extraction or if you're doing heptane or some other uh, solvent extraction, you can simply put your biomass in the material, uh, material biomass inside of the glass reactor and from your feed inlet can actually pump in solvent and just use that stir motor much like a, a centrifuge to extract and kind of homogenize that biomass out of there. Uh, the big problem would be that the biomass is going to be heavily saturated when you pull it out of there because you're not really going to be able to get a, um, you know, a, a washing machine drainage effect that you'll have in uh, these other centrifuges. Uh, however, it can be used for extraction, uh, for the making of RSO oil. I have used it in the case that one of my primary centrifuges goes down, or this is all that I have available. Uh, also, kind of before extraction centrifuges were heavily manufactured, this was also a way in the early days or the pioneer days to get a better extraction without going caveman, still be um, controlled and scientific about it. So that's one of the uses. Another use is decarboxylation. Now, when you have your cannabinoids in there, winterized or whatever they are, inside of your glass reactor, you can actually use that auxiliary equipment to, um, to decarboxylate it, like the Huber Unistat, at approximately 130 to 140 degrees Celsius. Uh, using the temperature probe, you can monitor the internal temperature. You can also hook up the condensing coils so any volatiles that boil off will be recondensed and you can collect those and discharge them appropriately. And that stir motor is really going to make sure that everything is mixing around and you're getting an even reaction uh, throughout. Now, I will say that this is probably the number one use that I use a glass reactor for is large-scale decarboxylation. Uh, if you're on a smaller scale, you might be using something like a Griffin beaker and a magnetic stir. Uh, however, um, you know, a heating plate. Uh, however, when you get into the 50 liters or 100 liters per hour that you need decarboxylated, there's really no better solution 
uh, than one of these glass reactors. So another method that you actually can use the glass reactor for, while not suggested theoretically is possible, is by winteri is winterization. Now you can introduce your cannabinoids that you need winterized or your crude oil that you need winterized and use that auxiliary equipment to drop the temperature down and then at the bottom of the discharge valve that we showed you, you can actually inline a filtration system that will catch all of those fats, lipids, and nucleopeptides that are present in your crude oil. So um, not the most not the best application, but however, with a simple glass reactor only, you can almost effectively pull off every part of the extraction and post-production process minus the distillation. And, uh, you know, I, I suggest that you probably could use it for solvent recovery. It would just take you an incredible amount of time. But with a glass reactor, a rotovap, and a short path distillation unit on a small scale, you would be able to make anything from crude oil to distillate to CBD isolate. So it can be used for winterization as well. Another common practice uh, for these glass reactors is isolation. Um, now, we have those SOPs in different videos in this training course. However, you can use the um, glass reactor primarily. Now, whether it's a glass reactor or a stainless steel reactor, the reactionary vessel is basically the same, just the materials that it's composed of. I like the glass because I like to be able to visually monitor the reaction that's taking place. But stainless steel reactor, it's the exact same thing. Uh, you can use it the exact same way. However, if it is a stainless steel reactor, you need to make sure that it is at least 316 stainless steel or passivated. That way you do not oxidize the material inside or create a reaction in your stainless steel. Uh, but basically, you'll just bring your um, distilled oil, cannabis oil, or hemp oil into the reactionary vessel, load in your crashing solvent, whether that's heptane or pentane, and you'll use that stir motor to homogenize and supersaturate. Then you can drop the temperature using your auxiliary equipment until your CBD crashes out. And the, um, the glass reactor, the only difference that I would make when using for isolation is you'll notice in the other um, diagram that we showed you, the lid was at the top. So we want to be able to remove the crystals from the bottom if used for this application. However, even if we can't remove the crystals from the bottom, while it will be a tad bit more tedious, we can still use these glass reactors for CBD isolation. Now another thing that we can use them for is THC remediation or pesticide remediation. This is essentially a large separatory funnel, especially with the uh, discharge valve. At the bottom, we can homogenize uh, whether we're looking to reverse the polarity of our THC or use some sort of catalyst um, or other materials like uh, oxygen and uh, ultraviolet light to kind of uh, remediate that THC or convert it over to CBN or reverse the polarity and wash it out with some sort of brine water. All of that can be done inside of a glass reactor. You'll notice uh, one of the famous, well, I say famous, but the newly pioneered pieces of THC remediation equipment online right now is the TSEP from Precision, and you will notice that they are essentially three glass reactors in tandem with each other. Now, the THC remediation, while the catalyst is different, works much the same way as the pesticide remediation. So, chances are that you have... One of these, uh, you know, processes inside of your laboratory. So if you're looking at an industrial scale, I would highly look into getting a glass reactor. Now you know what one is used for and you can kind of do your equipment 
shopping uh, based on that. But anything that needs mixing or reactions under controlled temps or vacuum, uh, the glass reactor is the way to go. So for today, that's all I have for you guys. I hope that you have an awesome day. Be blessed, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.